In this video, I will teach you the fastest and most practical way to read an EKG so you don't miss any important EKG findings. Remember, you are not going to master this way as soon as you finish this video. Practice is the key to mastering this way and becoming your default way of reading EKGs. I'll be providing you with some examples in the second half of this video. In the description field, you will find a link to the EKGs I'm going to use in this video. So let's not waste any time and start right now. Of course, after you subscribe to our channel if you have not subscribed yet, and please give us a like if you found this video useful. Let's go. The first step in EKG reading is something a lot of us forget about it. Although it's very important, is to get the most recent EKG if available so we have a baseline EKG to compare to. Put it next to the current EKG, don't look at it yet. The second step before you take any glance at the EKG, please forget about your patient's signs and symptoms. Here we are just going to describe what we see on the EKG without any clinical correlation. Just describe what you see in the EKG. Now it's time to look at the current EKG. If you are still a beginner in EKG readings, remember to write down each finding with each step. The next step is to assist the rhythm by looking at lead two. An upright P wave in lead two indicate a sinus rhythm mechanism. I will have a separate video to discuss the rhythm. Next is to assist the rate, axis, and interval. The PR interval, the QRS duration, and the QTC interval quickly by looking at the top left corner of the EKG. I call this a quick cheat sheet. The information provided here is pretty accurate. We could do this manually ourselves, but to save time, we can rely on the accurate computer reading. As a side note, computer interpretation is pretty accurate in calculating the rate, intervals, and axis, but not so much in all other interpretations, including ischemic changes, although this may get better in the future. Next, if the QRS complex duration is wide, more than 100 milliseconds, we need to find out why before proceeding to the next step. If the QRS is narrow, less than 100 milliseconds, then skip this step. So quickly look for causes of wide QRS, bundle branch block with the right or left, intraventricular conduction delay, paced rhythm, etc. Again, this will be discussed in a separate video. Next is to check if ventricular hypertrophy is is present or not. Of course, we need to know the ventricular hypertrophy EKG patterns in order to do this step. Again, this will be discussed in a separate video. The last step is to look for any acute or chronic ischemic EKG changes. Here we look at the QRST changes. We check the Q waves, R wave progression, ST segment changes, and T wave changes. Now we finish reading the current EKGs. We wrote our findings down. It's time to compare our findings to the baseline EKG if available. Next, we come to the final step, which is the clinical correlation. Now it's the time we correlate our EKG findings with the patient's signs and symptoms to make the most appropriate clinical decisions accordingly. So let's together read some EKGs using this systematic way. I have to say here that the sequence to read EKG is not important as long as we cover all the points. Let's go. Let's start with our EKG. So the first step is to have a baseline EKG next to this EKG so I can compare to if it's available. And the second step, I will forget completely now about the patient's signs and symptoms. I will just describe what I see in this EKG. Next, I will jump to lead two looking for an upright P wave as you see here. So they are looking the same. So this is a sinus rhythm mechanism. And again, we'll go into more details about rhythm when we talk about it in a separate video. The next thing usually, which I cut it off, you will find information, computer interpretation about the rate, axis, and intervals right in this corner, which I cut it off so the patient name doesn't appear. But again, the rate is, I'm gonna use the manual way between the R, R interval. There is almost three and a half boxes. So the heart rate around 80s or a little bit less or a little bit more. So the patient's not tachycardiac nor bradycardic. Then the axis, I look at lead one. All, all of this, I will explain it and actually explain some of it already, but will be explained in more details down the road. But there is upright QRS, positive QRS in one, negative QRS in AVF. So this is a 
left axis deviation whenever i see left axis deviation i immediately look at lead two if it's negative or not if it's negative then this patient has a left anterior hemifascicular block again this will be discussed later on left axis deviation negative lead two this is left anterior hemifascicular block so i'm writing each step as i'm going through this way the intervals you can look at the pr interval i don't I think it looks prolonged I'm not gonna spend time counting these and that's why I use the interpretation the computer interpretation to save me all of that time the QRS itself seems pretty narrow less than 100 milliseconds and the ST segment again we talk about the corrected ST segment to the heart rate it looks a bit prolonged here I think it's borderline and I will use my calculation the one is here to save me time and you can use the equation it looks slightly prolonged if I'm not mistaken the next thing is looking for for hypertrophy for right ventricular hypertrophy criteria or left ventricular hypertrophy and again these are pattern you have to know and we'll discuss them down the road but I looked if there is a big R on AVR on V1 there is not so there is no R wave uh, there is no right ventricular hypertrophy look at V2 and V6 the QRS amplitude is not that high in both so this patient doesn't have uh, LVH or RVH the next thing I look at the QRST changes I start with the Q wave and I look Look at the leads in groups high lateral leads one and avl together then i go to three uh, two three avf the inferior leads especially three is reciprocal to avl so that way i compare reciprocal leads right away after that i go to right sided lead avr and v1 after that i look at v2 v3 and v4 actually v3 and v4 are the anterior leads v1 and v2 are septal leads and i finish by looking at the v5 v6 let's look for a q wave in one and avl I don't see if anything it's pretty insignificant I don't see let's go to the entry uh, to, to the inferior leads lead two there is no there is a small r lead three yes I see a QS complex actually so there is a Q wave and it looks deep right AVF the same I see a Q wave and it may meet the criteria of pathological Q wave but again we are just describing what we see I go to um, lead AVR all um, remember AVR uh, it's usually reciprocal to most of the leads on this side other than V1 and V2 I think V1 I don't see a Q wave I don't see in V2 I don't see a V3 I don't see a Q wave in V4 nothing in V5 or V6 just really Q waves in lead 3 and AVF after that I go to the R wave and mainly the R wave progression and progression usually happen the QRS becomes a turn, a switch from negative to positive usually around V3 and I see it's still negative V3 still negative V4 still negative even in V6 so there is very if any R wave progression and in my mind why right I need to explain this and I can tell you that I know why because there was a left anterior hemifascicular block we diagnosed that we said left axis deviation with negative lead two. That's explain why there is a poor R wave progression. And then finally, I finish and also look if there is any prominent R wave in V1 and AVR uh, that indicate right ventricular strain or right ventricular hypertrophy. Now go to the ST changes. I go the same ST and segment N1 and AVL. Nothing abnormal here, no elevation or depression inferior leads two three and avf the same remember avl is mirror image to lead three if you look at the the location of these leads you will know why they are reciprocal to each other let's go to lead v1 i don't see any significant st changes uh, lead to the same lead three the same so i don't see this is an artifact here so i don't see any significant st segment depression or elevation we finish with t wave and again t wave seems pretty normal going the same direction as qrs in most leads and that's usually what t wave does uh, you see t wave inversion in v1 which is pretty normal same for avr pretty normal i may see in lead avl maybe a slightly inverted t wave if any that's usually reciprocal to lead three so now I'm writing all of this. So the patient has a normal sinus rhythm rate around 80. There is left axis deviation with left anterior hemifascicular block. There is poor R wave progression. There is Q waves noted in lead 3 and lead AVF. No ST segment elevation or depression. There is T wave inversion V1, AVR, maybe AVL. So these are my findings. Now the next thing is I look at the old EKG, the most recent EKG. I see if these findings were existent or they are new. 
very important. And the last part, now I look at my patient, what kind of signs and symptoms my patient, is he completely asymptomatic or is he complaining of chest pain or shortness of breath and try to correlate these findings with that. That's how I do interpret EKG the systematic way we just explained. Let's do one more EKG quickly. Again, get an old EKG to compare to. Forget about patient signs and symptoms. Look at lead two. There is a P wave before each QRS looking the same. This is a sinus rhythm mechanism. The heart rate is clearly the patient is tachycardiac. at less than three boxes. So probably around 120 uh, or 125 the heart rate. So the patient having sinus tachycardia. After that, I usually look at the cheat sheet, which again, we cut it off. But the patient rate, we mentioned that, and the axis upright in lead one, slightly upright in AVF, so still within normal limit, the axis. The PR interval seems okay. The QRS is narrow. The QTC, of course, you have to calculate because it's um, it, the patient is tachycardiac. Again, is it prolonged or not? It's very hard. I have to do the full calculation. But again, I can easily uh, cheat it from the information here. Next, is there any uh, RVH or LVH? I don't see any criteria for that. And we'll discuss that in separate videos. Next, I look at the QST changes. Q wave, let's say, a, I don't see one here. I don't see an AVL. I can see it in three and maybe very small one in lead two. Of course, it's in V1, it's in AVR, and maybe very small one in V5, very small of anything. And then the R wave progression happened appropriately at V3. After that, I look at the ST segment. You can clearly see it screaming to us, there's ST segment V2, V3, V4, and we'll come to that. How do you decide this is elevated or depressed and based on what's the baseline to compare it to what, to the PR segment or TP segment, we'll come to that. But there is ST elevation, not just that. You can look at the T wave with the same Lees are is hyper acute. So there is ST elevation here and hyper acute peak T wave in V2, V3, V4. Otherwise, I don't see any significant ST elevation or depression or any abnormal T waves. At this point, I look at the old EKG if I have it and compare to it. And only then I look at the patient. Is the patient having active chest pain with these findings? Of course, I will be very worried about a STEMI, right? Or the patient may be febrile, um, hypotensive, septic. So that's how quickly I run through these EKGs. All right, let's summarize this way again. Get a baseline EKG if available. Forget about your patient's signs and symptoms. Just describe what you see in the EKG. Check the rhythm by assessing lead two. Check the rate, intervals, and axis using the quick cheat sheet. Check for the presence of hypertrophy, ventricular hypertrophy. Check for acute or chronic ischemic EKG findings, the QRST changes. I will be discussing each of the above points in separate videos. Before I finish my videos, the key to getting better in EKG reading is to practice, then practice, then practice. So keep reading EKGs and soon you will see the improvement. Thanks for watching.